Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to GGS 300, so Quantitative Methods for Spatial Sciences. Today we're on the second lecture and we're going to be looking at uh, an introduction to geographic data. So before we begin I just wanted to kind of catch up on where we're at and let's hope that last week you were able to complete the task which was essentially for you to actually get R installed on your machine and then also our studio, get everything up and running, uh, just simply be able to uh, print a message uh, from the from the script area and print it out in the console essentially and then if you've done that you'll be fully ready in order to kind of grasp this this week with 100% of your attention span so if you're not there yet make sure you reach out to me as soon as possible the last thing I want is you know the day before the assignment is due uh, everybody emailing me <laughs> saying that they're not able to get the software started or that they've got a problem with their machine uh, because that, that's just not any good for anyone okay Great, so let's begin. Uh, I think you should be able to contact me now if, if you have any issues. Oh, and one thing I am forgetting is just to emphasize again that we because we've got a small class this time, uh, we won't be having a graduate uh, teaching assistant, which is good news for you because it means you get to liaise directly with me. So don't hesitate to reach out to me if you've got any particular problems. So today we're going to be talking about some of the key issues with geographic data. We're also going to be talking about kind of aspects of data in general. So for those of you who have already done uh, some statistics classes before, then some of this will be well-trodden ground. But then there'll also be new aspects which will probably be introduced to you based around some of the problems which specifically occur when we're dealing with uh, spatial data, okay? Great, so I think I just wanted to begin and think a little bit about the types of data that maybe you and I engage with on a daily basis, okay? So uh, I think the easiest way for me to do this is talk about some of the technology that we engage with on a daily basis because we are perpetually bombarded with statistics, essentially. So I'm just giving you example here from my uh, Fitbit app. So on, the, on this side of the screen, the left-hand side here, uh, you can see what is essentially a dashboard, okay? So this is kind of my aggregated metrics for a single day. It's telling me the number of steps that I've taken that day, the number of equivalent flights of stairs that I've basically taken, uh, the maximum number of calories that I've probably burnt, and then something about my sleep score as well and my heart rate, okay? So that's uh, kind of basic descriptive data uh, about my day. Most of them are just... Uh, 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 aggregates. Uh, there's there's uh, some mean data there as well, I presume, given that we have some uh, heart rate uh, uh, indicator here, and this is going to be you know averaged over all of those minutes and hours of the day so far. Okay, so this is kind of standard stuff, and I'm sure all of you are pretty much perpetually on your cell phone and engaging with this type of data on on an hourly basis. Then on the right hand side here, what we have is uh, a little bit. Uh, kind of more detailed data. So this is again for my heart rate. And this is basically giving me at the top here, it's the resting heart rate for the past 30 days. Okay, so it's a little bit cryptic because they don't give you the x-axis, but you kind of get the point, which is that over the last month, uh, my resting heart rate has basically oscillated between about 59 and 62 beats per minute. I thought this was really good. And then actually I Googled and found out that if it's below 60, that's actually quite worrying because there's actually uh, this kind of slow heart rate uh, problem that you can have. I'm hoping that this is about 60 because I've done a little bit of fitness when when, when this was being taken, uh, this screenshot. So let's hope that I'm not about to drop dead and die, unfortunately. Okay, and at the bottom here, what you've got are just some daily snapshots. Okay, so these are just time series. This is probably aggregated every minute uh, throughout the day for those periods where I've been wearing my watch. So you can see that I've got a gap here. Maybe that's today. So we haven't recorded data there yet. Maybe on Tuesday I was uh, was uh, charging my watch, so we don't have it. But you get the key point, which is that you get a nice time series and you get indicators of, of exercise, kind of high activity periods where you get these peaks, okay? Um, and that's kind of useful information. So this is the kind of temporal aspect that maybe you and I all engage with, particularly as thanks to these things, we have so many sensors uh, within our environment, on us, even the cell phone itself is sensing our own movement, um, sensing our um, activity throughout the day, okay? So 
let's move on. We also have lots of other types of data, and I like to talk a little bit about the data from the money markets or the stock markets uh, as we're looking at here. So essentially, this is uh, a good example of another kind of time series uh, set of data which you may engage with on a fairly regular basis if you're interested in uh, stocks, managing money, things like this, uh, very exciting careers in, in this area. So for down here, what we have is the S&P 500 index. So this is the top 500 largest companies in the United States across all of the stock exchanges. So that's, you know, either New York, Chicago, etc. And essentially, this is an indicator of uh, the value of that uh, particular index. Uh, and I presume this is days down here. This might even be more granular than this. But the key point is that you get a time series of this uh, of this data. This is a good example from last year. So this is probably about March, April last year, uh, those couple of months where there's quite a big dip in the stock market. It's actually all picked up um, uh, by now. It's actually higher than it was before COVID hit, um, which is probably indicative of the stage of the economic cycle which we're in. But anyway, I thought maybe some of you would be interested in engaging this type of data. If you are, there's plenty of examples of uh, those types of uh, data sources out there. You can get it from Google. This one here I got just a screen grab from Market Watch, but you can go and look at how some of those uh, uh, those time series data are displayed for uh, individual countries in this case, but also for you can look at exchange rates or other types of uh, economic money monetary flows. Some of you, if you're doing kind of more geography, spatial data science work, then you'll probably be engaging with Census Bureau statistics at some point. Um, that's probably also true for some people in civil engineering. Uh, that may also be true for people uh, in other parts of kind of the arts and humanities who may be interested in uh, demographic information. And the United States Census Bureau, uh, some of you probably have already uh, touched upon. There's loads of data there. They hold all the census data and they produce the, those kind of data sets that you might be interested in, whether it's interests that you have in you know, age or race or household composition or whatever it is. And you can kind of pull those off at really whatever spatial uh, aggregation layer you want. So they're going to be collecting that data at the census tract level, which I believe is probably the lowest level that you can extract the data for. And then they're going to be able to aggregate that. Say, for example, you want county data or you want state data, then it will just be the aggregation of all of that lower level data uh, that you are then able to uh, extract. So a lot of the work that I've done has been in engineering, but I've always, always had some sort of key population demographic spatial data within it. So even if you go into the more kind of quantitative fields, this type of data is just used uh, ubiquitously. So it's really a great place to kind of uh, get to grips with the type of data that you could be using if you, you know, spread your wings, leave Mason, go off and join a company or join go the government uh, working uh, in, in areas pertaining to uh, spatial data. Okay. And then I thought another good way uh, that we engage with kind of spatial data is uh, through the weather forecasts. And, um, you know, quite regularly, we'll always be kind of wondering about what the weather may be uh, ahead of time. And uh, thankfully, the weather forecasts have got a lot better in the last few years. But I, I've always been in, in D.C. in September for the last, you know, five, six, seven years uh, for a conference. And obviously that's kind of the tail end of hurricane season. Um, and then I, I, I feel that one of the you know most common ways that I'm kind of thinking about statistical data, you know, outside of my own work is when I'm kind of watching the weather forecast, particularly, you know, unfortunately, if there's a big hurricane coming in, it's making landfall. And what you might have is uh, you might have a current location like here, uh, and then you might have forecasts for where people expect it to be. Maybe they can uh, do a, a four day forecast and that's what this white part of the hurricane track here is and they could have reasonably high statistical confidence for that track. And then beyond that point, uh, it's really kind of unknown as to where that hurricane is going to be. There's probably too much uncertainty to give a kind of certain forecast. So you kind of have this uh, tail area of where they, they think it may be. Obviously, it could find out in a variety of different directions. So it's quite a, a large uh, margin of error there, uh, particularly uh, given that this is you know many hundreds of miles uh, across this part of the uh, the hurricane track forecast. Okay, so maybe that's another way that we're engaging with uh, data on a regular basis. 
So let's start to think then about those types of data sets that I just mentioned in terms of those particular kind of spatial data issues that are going to be uh, key. So um, there's going to be a range of them that you need to consider and you will be tested on them. And uh, it's important because if you go off and you leave Mason, you build a model, uh, you want to make sure that you're not kind of validating, uh, invalidating uh, some of the model assumptions that you, you might have to meet in order to um, uh, produce something for your your daily work so all models are going to be garbage in garbage out okay so we just need to make sure that we're meeting all of those assumptions and there are issues that you need to be aware of to think critically about the data sources that you might use in uh, in your day job particularly if you're using uh, models but also if you're using survey data things like this um, you need to be fully aware of uh, what the data may or may not represent so before we get to that, let's just think a little bit about kind of this scientific process that I touched on before. So you'll remember that I spoke last time about uh, empiricism, uh, kind of how that kind of took root from Francis Bacon back in probably about the 16th century. Uh, and then that kind of empiricism has kind of really fostered uh, enlightenment scientific thinking through the last 300 years or so. And now our kind of approach to doing science is obviously heavily quantitative. It's based on, very often it's based on observation, collecting empirical data. Um, and therefore there's a question around, well, how do we do science? Uh, how do we use the data? How do we collect data in this way in order to basically learn something about the world? You know, actually understand truth. So what's a good example? Well, this is an example of a project that I've been doing recently for the World Bank, which is, well, how do you actually provide universal broadband across the whole African continent? So um, this is obviously an absolutely huge area. It's, uh, I think it's, it's one of the top two most populated continents in the world. Uh, obviously, there's very many low and middle income countries uh, across the African continent, and many of those countries would quite like to have universal broadband because it fosters economic development, but it's actually quite hard to deliver. So it could be potentially expensive to deploy the infrastructure, and also uh, maybe there's not that many users in the area, and for the users that are there, maybe they aren't able to easily pay for the service. So you don't actually have kind of an economically viable way to deliver this infrastructure. So the problem, therefore, is, well, which strategies are going to effectively work? And where are they going to work? And this is the kind of problem which I, I've been given in my research in which I've then developed models, strategies to try and um, address. So the type of data that I've used is, uh, for example, we need the population data for all of these local statistical areas. So these uh, data areas are well below the national level and they're providing us with an indication of where the main populated areas are across um, uh, across the African continent. So obviously there's not very much in the Sahara Desert region here. West Africa is highly populated, so it's so some parts of uh, East Africa as well. So this kind of gives you an understanding as to where the bulk of the population is. Okay. And then essentially what I've been able to do with the models I've been able to develop is to then make estimates for how much it would cost to deploy uh, 4G cellular universal broadband uh, in these different areas. OK, um, and, and that is, you know, that's a challenging problem. It requires uh, a kind of a good understanding for how the scientific process takes place. And, and that's what we're going to touch on in this part of the lecture. OK, so I'm going to work you through how we carry out that process. So the first question is, what's the research question? OK, so if you're going to go off and you want to, to find out uh, something interesting about the world or decide some sort of strategy that you need to implement, then you're probably going to start from the existing theory. And then that theory you're probably going to use to inform uh, a set of data analysis techniques um, uh, that you're going to potentially empirically derive. OK. So um, you're going to want to uh, analyze some data and find something interesting about the world. OK, so this is the way that, that this, the scientific process usually works. And then at the end, once you've kind of drawn conclusions from that data, you kind of then close the feedback loop and you kind of draw some theoretical understanding from it. And you put that back into the literature and you have this kind of iterative process of theory leading to new empirical research and empirical research leading to new theory. OK, so it's quite a nice kind of uh, iterative process. 
The challenge is always going to be, well, what type of data do we need to, in order to answer that specific research question that we just uh, stated? So if we want to know uh, which strategies we should use to deploy universal broadband across the African continent, then we're going to need data on where the population are, going to need data on the level of existing broadband coverage from 2G, 3G or 4G uh, uh, cellular communications. So basically where people are able to already get a decent phone signal which provides them with fast broadband. Uh, and then we kind of want to identify those areas that aren't covered. Okay, so this is kind of the way that we need to uh, gather these data sets. So a lot of what I do is very much based on satellite data layers and it's very, very data intensive. Um, but you may be doing other things. You may be doing things like taking survey data, okay? And that kind of requires a different methodology. So how do we collect the required data? Well, it's kind of easy for what I do because the data sets very often already out there and we can just use them. The problem is if uh, you need to go out and you need to carry out a survey of specific kind of specific subpopulations that you're interested in, okay, that's going to be more time consuming. It's going to require you to think statistically about how you collect that data and whether it is essentially representative overall of the population that you're trying to actually examine. So I'm going to keep coming back to this particular box diagram as we move through the course. And it looks really kind of maybe overwhelming for some of you right now, but it's actually fairly simple. By the end of the course, you'll understand this quite thoroughly. So for example, in this left-hand part here, this is what we're doing in the first third of the course. And then the two thirds uh, afterwards, so the latter two thirds, we'll be focusing on this part over here, okay? so. We have a problem which we identify, um, and uh, let's say we're going to use um, uh, descriptive uh, data. We're going to use that descriptive data to try and understand the problem. Then we basically invest. We develop questions to investigate this problem uh, using. Then we go out and we collect, prepare that data. We process and we develop descriptive statistics of that data, and then we reach conclusions. So this is the simplest type of statistical approach. Um, there are obviously some limitations with it. It's not as um, it's not as rigorous as some of the formal uh, statistical analyses that we're going to do later in this course, but it's a very basic approach for going out, finding uh, kind of a problem that you want to investigate, stating some research questions, gathering some data, um, understanding that data, and then reaching conclusions about the data. Okay, so that's a fairly standard way to, to, to start um, investigating specific problems. As you will see as we move through this course, some of those concepts that we develop in the first third of the course, and this includes things like probability, uh, this includes things relating to survey collection, survey analysis, you can then use that information in order to specify formal hypotheses and then to statistically test whether we think those formal hypotheses are true or false, okay? So we can uh, specify what we think these hypotheses are, we can collect and, and uh, prepare that data, we can test it formally using inferential statistics, and then we can evaluate the hypotheses that, that we, that we uh, gain insight on, whether they're true or false, for example. Okay, so this is more advanced, but we'll be doing it later in the term. And then essentially what we're able to do is to, uh, to further refine the model that we've developed or the theory. Uh, and then we're also able to hopefully, this is the important bit, actually gain impact and influence decisions from the information that we found. Okay, so you can think of it as this being really quite academic, this bit here, but it's very important. Um, and then this bit over here being kind of more real world and... Uh, you know, I'm one of those academics who thinks that we should be doing things which make the world a better place. And therefore, it's really important that we're actually able to kind of take the academic work that we do and actually influence decisions that people make in industry or in government in order for us to kind of push forward economic development, make the world more environmentally sustainable uh, and hopefully make uh, society a better place for everyone. OK. So just think of the division of labor in this as descriptive statistics over here on the left hand side and inferential statistics over here on the right hand side. OK, and this uh, diagram is, is in the textbook that hopefully all of you have now.
and which you've obviously read because there was a chapter last week um, and then it will be kind of picked up as we move through this next part of uh, of the course okay so make sure you've got that and you're reading it uh, in tandem with taking these lectures so those spatial issues that I want to talk about today. So we need to be cognizant of these different spatial data issues which arise specifically when we're using uh, spatial, um, spatially explicit data. OK, so these are boundary de delineations. So this is where we're drawing our boundaries, which boundaries we're choosing. Um, and this also kind of relates to the modifiable aerial units problem. So let's think about how we're aggregating that data. Don't worry, I'm going to go into each one of these next. Um, spatial scale and aggregation. So as I said before, um, it relates to the MAU, the modifiable aerial unit problem. This does start to affect the results. So we need to think about how we aggregate this data. And we also need to think about how we then draw conclusions from this data. So ecological fallacy aspects. Are we drawing uh, the correct conclusions from the data that we have and generalizing perhaps maybe data from a sample correctly to an entire population? Boundary delineation. <laughs> so this is very sad. It, yes, it does keep me up at night uh, because it changes your results and you have to be kind of aware about how it's affecting the results that, that you're producing. OK, and along with unit errors, these are some of the kind of common issues that, that we can um, uh, encounter when we're carrying out quantitative analysis. So. Um, I say unit errors, and that's because, you know, imagine that you've uh, assumed something is meters and it's kilometers or something like this. Obviously, it can produce just something that's completely wrong. Um, and therefore, you need to be kind of aware of, of these kind of basic decisions which you make within your research and how it may affect the final result that you obtain. OK. So boundary delineation. Uh, this is the issue that any boundary which we basically exogenously decide to impose um, to, to actually aggregate the data, for example, is essentially artificially imposed. OK, um, so so this is a boundary which we decide uh, exists within this specific space. Uh, and that's an issue. It may mean that if we change the boundary, we get a different answer. Uh, it may mean that uh, we, we, we draw the wrong conclusions if we're not aware of how these boundaries are kind of sitting on top of the underlying data which we have. OK, so a good example, we uh, use census boundaries all the time. So this is um, an example for Fairfax County. Uh, you can also see Fairfax City here. You can see some of the census tracts underneath in, in, um, in uh, grey. So we're dealing with this data all the time. And the question is, well, how representative of these uh, relatively arbitrary boundaries that have been uh, divided here. So obviously these will probably reflect political boundaries. Uh, they'll probably also reflect some of the, 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 the built environment. Uh, they probably also reflect some of the natural environment. You can see here this particular boundary is definitely bordering up against the, uh, against the river. So that's how we often end up with these relatively artificial boundaries. I guess the question is, well, what happens if instead of using those artificial boundaries, uh, we actually use a one kilometre square grid instead? So this is an example for Germany, uh, for Cologne. And you can see here what you end up having is a lot of highly granular insight when you're using a one by one uh, kilometre uh, grid. OK, so I quite like to use this level of granularity and then impose the other kind of um, census boundaries on top. And then you know that you're kind of able to extract from uh, the, the most granular level and then you can kind of change the other boundaries and see how it may affect your results. OK, so why does it matter? Well, we encounter this thing called the modifiable aerial unit problem. OK. So this is a challenge that occurs during the spatial analysis of aggregated data in which the results differ when the same analysis is applied to the same data, but at different aggregation levels. OK, so imagine that we have this original data here and we have nine data points. OK, so n equals nine. That's the number of samples that we have. And then we just take the uh, we take the mean here uh, f across across this uh, um, uh, across all of these squares, what we end up is 8.88. OK, however, if we then uh, kind of scale this data differently, so we basically take the mean within each one of these 
uh, rectangles here and we end up with 6.66, 11.66 and 6.66 here. Um, and then we average across these, we get 8.33. So we get a very minor uh, change, but this could actually lead to quite significant differences if, for example, uh, you're aggregating over very extreme areas or um, uh, you're, for example, carrying out a piece of analysis and your judgments are kind of based on a kind of boundary point. And maybe you cross a threshold of concern to you and then it might lead you to, to, to basically draw the wrong conclusion. So you need to be aware of this. So this is really a scaling issue here. And then down here, what we have we, are the, the averages taken based on different uh, zoned boundaries. So we'll talk all about this in more depth in the next few slides. But you can see if you look at the averages taken and the average that you get overall, uh, that you end up with different numbers based on how these zones are drawn relative to the original data. OK, so you can read more about that in the book. I'm going to give you some more examples now and we're gonna go through this in a bit more detail. So every time you make a decision uh, about your method, you need to kind of consider the ramifications of the boundaries which you're going to draw. So the dimensions to consider are, for example, zoning. So uh, the results uh, may vary based on the, the, the boundary that you choose. So um, let's assume here that we have uh, a, set of, a set of points. And I just, I just uh, placed this link in here because I thought it was quite funny. So this is, I hope you're able to see this. I know that uh, I'm not accessing the international uh, BBC website here, but these people just yesterday completed a straight line challenge. OK, so this is, I think this is the longest straight line that you could go in the UK without passing a road. And they walked it and they said it was incredibly challenging because it was through incredibly kind of quite a mountainous area of Scotland. Uh, and they weren't able to deviate from the line, okay? So they just literally had to walk directly in a straight line. You can see that it would be really quite arduous if you were kind of walking up essentially a mountain cliff face or wading through, um, you know, waist high heather essentially, which is what these guys did, okay? So just imagine that that straight line walk that those people did, they just placed, uh, took a GPS marker and they were walking at a constant speed and they just had a point taken every, uh, you know, um, every one kilometer, for example. And let's just say we were then interested in counting up these different points because it gives us some indication as to how long they spent in each grid square. So imagine we have this line of points that these walkers have placed. And then we have a boundary set that we create, okay? So if we have these four grid squares here, and then we count the number of points in each one. So for this, this upper left-hand grid square here, we have six points. For the upper right-hand square, we have two points. We have zero in the lower left-hand square, and the uh, lower right-hand square has 11 points, okay? So to find the mean across these four points here, uh, we would get 4.75, so we're basically adding them all up as the numerator and dividing by the number of grid squares that we have, which is 4. So we achieve this outcome. If we just slightly shift the boundary, can you see that? Can you see in the boundary set 2, we're just shifting the boundary a little bit. Shift the boundary a little bit, we recount those points and we end up with 8, 0, 0 and 13, and then when we basically divide uh, what is 21 by 4, we end up with a mean of 5.25, okay? So hopefully you can see how uh, these differences may affect your underlying results. And I suspect that many of you, if you're going to be working with spatial data, you're going to have some coordinate-based data as points. And those points uh, you may want to aggregate, and that's where this issue starts to come from. It's like what are the numbers that you basically extract as you change from those point-based um, uh, data items towards a kind of polygon area-based um, understanding of that data point, and is it meaningful? Okay. One of the other issues that you might be aware of is uh, electoral gerrymandering, okay? So this is just one example of how boundaries can be shifted, so artificial boundaries can be created and they basically provide different answers depending on how you structure the actual boundary lines, okay? So imagine that we have 50 precincts here, 60% are yellow and 40% are green. 
uh, we can have uh, disproportionate outcomes. So we could draw the boundaries here uh, horizontally and we'd end up with uh, five districts and each one of them would be won by yellow. So yellow wins all of them, okay. Or what we could do is we could draw the boundaries in a very different way like this, um, but this essentially means that what you end up with are three boundaries uh, being, th three areas being won by green, two by yellow, which means green wins the majority overall, okay. So that's a good example of disproportionate outcomes. We don't really want those, but often because the incumbent political party uh, has the ability to redraw the electoral districts, it's just one example, um, then this stuff does happen, unfortunately. Uh, and it does mean that you end up with potentially skewed outcomes, okay? You can get proportionate outcomes. So here, there's a good example. Um, so if you drew the lines in this particular way, which is unlikely for electoral boundaries, you would end up with an even outcome. So three being yellow, two being green, which is proportional to the percentages that we have, or you could draw them like this as well, okay? So this is a good example. You may or may not have come across gerrymandering before, but it, it happens, unfortunately, quite a bit. I did write a paper relatively recently, and I talk, spoke about it before, where we were collecting Wi-Fi access point information, and uh, we were making a predictive model. So it was kind of based on the idea that, well, if you gave me a building and it, I had a particular floor area, a certain number of floors, um, a certain size of each floor, then we'd be able to predict how many Wi-Fi access points would be present in that building. As we had both um, collected data, uh, which was real, and we had predicted data, uh, we were able to basically um, dimension this data based on different buffer sizes. So as we had a point here for a Wi-Fi point, maybe we would draw a 100 meter boundary and then count the buildings within it and the other Wi-Fi points, and then we'd plot them on these graphs. And then we could repeat it again for a 200 meter boundary here, or a 300 meter boundary. And then we we're able to see how this modifiable aerial unit problem uh, changed as essentially uh, the size of the, the boundary was, was varied, okay? So it's quite nice when you look at it like this because you get to understand the sensitivity of uh, the boundary size, okay? Great. So spatial aggregation uh, across scales, so it's similar to the MAUP, very related. Uh, it's the same data aggregated to different scales resulting in variation in descriptive statistics. So it relates to what we've already spoken about already. So the variation may be systematic, predictable or uncertain. So let's say we take the average population for all uh, states. And then let's say we take the average population for counties, census tracts, blocks. And actually we're using the same data. But if you actually did that and you looked at the statistical outcomes for that, you would end up with very, very uh, different uh, statistics, particularly when you're looking at the, the more uh, granular data, you'd have far more variation. Whereas if you just looked at the state level, you're basically averaging away all of the kind of underlying nuance in the statistical data and you're getting a very aggregated understanding of um, what's happening beneath those statistical boundaries. So there's two things to consider for boundary delineation. It's essentially the zoning aspect and the aggregation aspect, okay? So now let's just finish this section off essentially. So I just wanted to kind of bring in the Oxford English Dictionary definition of a fallacy and that's essentially a mistaken belief or a mistake in uh, your reasoning. Um, which makes an argument invalid, okay? And this can happen when you kind of generalize from small samples of data or from highly aggregated aspects of data to other um, subpopulations that maybe you're interested in, okay? So a logical fallacy is where inferences on attributes of individuals or smaller aggregations come from group inferences. So, for example, New York State has a high population density, which is very often kind of driven by the size of New York City. Um, so therefore, let's say that we make uh, an assumption that uh, an individual from New York State is from a dense city because, it ha because the state overall has a high population density, which is obviously false. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and and that's that's just not true. So you need to be kind of aware of these statements. Um, it happens both with kind of aspatial statistics and with spatial statistics, but you need to kind of keep in mind 
uh, the way that you kind of treat this data once it's been aggregated because you're not able to kind of uh, directly infer or, or make an estimate for the local uh, kind of on the ground uh, statistical characteristics for an area once it's kind of been aggregated to a higher level because you're just losing all of that kind of spatial nuance that I've spoken about earlier. Okay, great. So we are kind of more than halfway through the lecture now, so we can start to move on to the different types of data, and I'll try and do this as quickly as possible for you. We already spoke kind of at a very aggregated level, more abstract level, about the differences between quantitative researchers and qualitative researchers and their different schools of thought in the previous lecture. Okay, so I kind of raised about the philosophy of science and how maybe there's not always agreement between these two groups about how you can kind of extract information from the world. Here we're interested just purely in the types of data, and those data can either be you know, quantitative, they can be um, uh, numerical information such as temperature, such as rainfall, it's measured, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a uniform approach to measuring that, it's repeatable, and then that kind of contrasts with qualitative data, okay, so this is your non-numerical data, um, so it's going to be kind of language-based, so it's cate categorical-based, so, so for example, maybe we're, we're looking at land use in a particular area, and we're able to say that this is agricultural land, or it's forest land, or it's a, a lake area, or it's prairie. So essentially, uh, we're able to uh, kind of discern these differences. Um, okay, now we're going to kind of get into more of this when we get into categorizing different types of data, but just, just be aware of the fact that you have both quantitative and qualitative, and that we're going to be kind of capturing that within what we do. Spatial versus non-spatial data. Obviously, spatial data has explicit geographic coordinates or locational information attached with it. Okay, so the most basic is going to be, you know, your X and Y latitude, longitude coordinates, or it could be other types of spatial information that you might get. It could be an address, for example. Um, that would be more kind of implicit spatial data if you had a street address, because you would probably need some additional information in order for you to kind of understand exactly what that meant. So you might need Google Maps, or you might need to look up in you know an address book, an A to Z. I don't think you guys use these anymore. This is what we basically did before Google Maps existed. <laughs> Okay, and uh, non-spatial data, so that's just, you know, any type of data that doesn't have spatial information associated with it. Obviously, there's plenty of that too, so that could be data from an industrial process that you're monitoring. It could be uh, laboratory data that you've collected, uh, so it could be if you're a biochemist, it could be if you're a physicist. None of this is going to have explicit spatial information within it. Temporal versus atemporal. So we've already touched on this because I know a lot of my examples earlier in the class was kind of focusing on the temporality of the data that we are constantly bombarded with, whether that's you know through a fitness app tracking a heart rate, or whether that's through stock markets changing over time, or whether it's the potential forecast that we may have for um, uh, a future hurricane track, essentially. Okay. So temporal data, we've kind of covered that now. Atemporal data, that's just anything that's basically not associated with time, okay? Right, individual data versus spatially aggregated data. So we, we kind of covered this when we were thinking about the structure of uh, those uh, data frames last week. So let's just think of our individual data, for example, as maybe you've got a row in a data frame or an Excel spreadsheet, and then we have all of those kind of characteristics of an individual. So maybe you have you have Ed's height, so Ed is, you know, Ed is six foot, that's something like 174 centimeters, I believe. Um, uh, and uh, Ed has blue eyes and brown hair, okay? So this is all like my individual data. And then you also have things like household income as well. But then we also have, well, essentially the outcome of uh, that process when we actually aggregate it to a census tract, for example. So let's assume that then we have um, uh, we have uh, the kind of average commute time uh, within a city for anyone who's trying to go to their place of work. Uh, let's assume that we have, uh, you know, the educational uh, attainment uh, at the state level, or even lower, lower, maybe at the census tract level, we have the level, the number of people who are kind of college educated, uh, the percentage, for example. Or even better, using my previous example, imagine that we've taken that household income level and then we've 
average date or we've taken the median for it uh, within that census tract okay so i think if you look at the credit rating agencies you know experience these types of credit card uh credit rating agencies that kind of give you a number which then indicate uh, kind of your eligibility for borrowing more money or the eligibility to have a credit card or to get a mortgage these these companies will have incredibly detailed information on that you know they're, they're, they're getting the median income down to the street level okay that's the level of aggregation so disaggregation that they want for um, for that type of information so it's it's aggregated away from you and your individual home and your individual household but it's still going to be incredibly detailed so that if uh, you know you apply for a more mortgage uh, and you live in this uh, this address already and you want to move to that address they have information about uh, what they think the median income is probably going to be in that area so let's move on now to these different aspects discrete versus continuous types of data okay so why don't I start with continuous because you're probably more familiar with that so this is um, let's say it's rained and we measure the rain in millimeters or let's say we measure land parcels in kilometers squared, okay? This is continuous. There's potentially an infinite number of possible values that we could have because, okay, let's say that we measured the rain in, uh, in, in, a, in a glass or a measurement device. We could, in theory, uh, m measure that down to have an infinite number of decimal places so it just becomes more and more and more exact. Okay, so we're measuring millimeters. What happens if we measure in micrometers and then down into nanometers? Okay, uh, that is possible, and you're able to think of it in that kind of decimalized way. Discrete variables, in contrast, are basically finite. So just think of these as the number of people, okay, in a city. So you can't have 0 0.5 people. You can only have one person or two people. Um, so as a consequence, it's going to be uh, a discrete value. It's not going to be decimalized. It's going to be an integer. If you understand what that means from computer science, so it's going to be a whole number, essentially. Uh, so it's the number of people in, uh, um, in a census tract or a city or the number of houses on a block. OK, so this is what we mean by discrete. OK, so that's good. We've made good progress there. So let's talk a little bit now about the types of data measures. So I spoke before about the kind of the difference between qualitative and quantitative. And that's kind of important when we get to these different level of measures here. So we're going to be interested in nominal data, which is basically categories, qualitative categories, which bear no order between each other. Then we're interested in ordinal data. So that's uh, qualitative categories which have an implicit order. OK. Um, so if I say, uh, you know, if I if you got a high rating or a low rating, uh, they're qualitative categories, but they have an implicit order. Uh, interval data is basically where you have some sort of arbitrary measurement points and then you're able to measure between these and compare between them. But you can't actually uh, multiply the numbers together. So um, I'll explain what we mean by that shortly. And then ratio data is the typical kind of data that you will engage with on you know, a daily basis. So uh, maybe you take a measurement and it's four centimeters. Uh, and then essentially you take another measurement of something and it's four centimeters. Well, you're able to add them together and the cumulative, uh, uh, the, the aggregated amount is eight centimeters. Okay, so it's a ratio based measurement system. So let me explain what I mean by these and then we'll do an example and then hopefully uh, that will kind of stick in your mind. So normal data is where we have qualitative descriptive classifications. OK, so they're mutually exclusive. So if, uh, you know, if we put everyone in the class into groups for who have uh, you know, blue eyes, green eyes, blau brown eyes, you're going to be in one of those categories. It's exclusive which category you're in. You can't be in multiple categories. OK. Uh, the data that you have are collective, uh, uh, collectively exhaustive. Uh, exhaustive. Uh, so basically, uh, every data value is assigned to a single category. Well, that's kind of uh, like what I said before regarding the kind of what your eye color or your hair color approach is. Although hair color is slightly tricky because you ha you could have multiple colors. So let's just stick with uh, eye color as the example. Um, uh, so I think this is fine. We've kind of covered this already. So it's imagine we put a land use type down on a parcel of land. So it's either you know forest, is it lake, is it farmland, is it an urban area? These are all going to have particular uses, and they're not going to 
cross between different types of land classifications, okay? So I just put the Landsat program down here, which I believe is a NASA-run program, uh, which, you know, for decades now has been categorizing using satellite imagery um, different parcels of land, okay? So that's, that's a useful data set that you might be interested in. Ordinal data is where we use qualitative categories, but we actually have a rank order within them. So it's indicative of one group being more or less than another. So let's say we have strongly ordered ordinal data. This basically uh, could be college, rank college rankings, or it could be the where, where people finish in a race. Okay, so maybe that's a bit better. So we, we just had the Olympics, and we just uh, we've got the Para Olympics at the moment taking place in Tokyo. So let's just think of how those people are going to finish when they run the 100 meters. You're going to have a very strongly ordered category for where people ended up uh, finishing. Okay, so you're going to have the first person getting gold, the second person getting silver, uh, the third person in the final getting bronze, uh, and then everyone else unfortunately doesn't get a, a medal, but they do get their kind of strict placing within that structure. So this is strongly ordered um, ordinal data. You could also have weekly ordered ordinal data. So if you um, are interested in where you might want to go out and get some tasty food, then you're going to kind of look at the, the rankings perhaps that Google provides you or, or someone else, um, uh, Yelp or whatever. And uh, they're going to have a kind of implicit ranking within it. And it's going to be like 3.4 stars or, you know, two stars. And that's going to be kind of more weakly ordered rel relative to um, the kind of strongly ordered uh, data that you already have, because the starring system is, is uh, you know, implicitly weaker. Um, you can have more variation. It's kind of an aggregation. Uh, it's an average of those stars that someone has given to that place. OK, so it's dead easy to remember this one because it's kind of it's in the name. So nominal is the category part, but ordinal is categories, but because it, it sounds like it's saying ordered, okay? So when you think ordinal, just think order, which means that it's categories, but they have an implicit uh, a ranking of some of some description. Interval data. So this is where we have some sort of magnitude of difference that we're able to, to understand. Um, so you can add and subtract between these values, but the zero point is essentially arbitrary. OK, so if we take Fahrenheit, um, the zero point uh, of Fahrenheit degrees is essentially the lowest temperature uh, where you, you um, the lowest temperature obtained at a mix of uh, ice, uh, water and, and common salts. OK, so this is arbitrary. It doesn't really have any specific meaning, um, but we use it to measure temperature. OK. Uh, dates is also a very good one <laughs> because obviously the year this year is, you know, 2021, but that's obviously an entirely arbitrary date. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, that, that kind of Christian based uh, um, uh, dating system dates back to uh, the birth of Christ, essentially. Um, but, you know, if a scientist was going to actually measure the date of the Earth, then the scientist would say, you know, 4.35 billion years. Uh, but that doesn't quite roll off the tongue quite as easily as uh, using, uh, you know, the kind of arbitrary date system which we have now, which is uh, arguably easier to use and obviously is kind of culturally, culturally rooted uh, in, in much of our kind of history as well. OK, ratio data. So this is really easy for you guys because you engage with it all the time. It's not new in any way. This is just the data in which a ratio magnitude can be determined. So um, we have a natural non-arbitrarily zero point. So if you have zero kilometers, uh, that's uh, very clear exactly what that means. Um, and then you're able to kind of multiply and divide across these ratio units as well. So if we um, so if we have 400 millilitres of rain, it's four times as much as 100 millilitres of rain. OK, so it's very kind of clear. You use this data in your scientific uh, inquiries in other modules which you've uh, you've encountered. So let me just give you an example here and you can stop the video now if you want and try and guess. Uh, which uh, types of data we have through each one of these uh, different uh, columns. Uh, okay, so you can have a chance now and you can guess whether you think it's going to be nominal, uh, what type of ordinal data you might have, whether we have interval or ratio data. Okay. Okay, I hope you managed to, you know, pause and have a think about that and just kind of see, okay, did what Ed t t told me, did uh, what uh, Ed uh, actually tell me kind of sink in or not and if it didn't that's fine but let's just let's just give it a go so the school name well 
Okay, that's obviously going to be a nominal type of data source because it's qualitative, it's mutually exclusive, uh, and therefore it's, it's clearly going to be that type. Then we have this national ranking, okay, so what is that? That's a ranking based on some sort of metrics which indicate how good a school is, and so that's going to be, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an ordering of some description, um, which kind of lends us to, to the kind of ordinal data type that we've already touched on. Uh, and actually then, because we have this kind of very strict ranking, so these are all the colleges uh, in Michigan ranked based on the national ranking, uh, this is therefore very strongly ordered data, okay, because it has a very clear play. So we have University of Michigan at 27 nationally, uh, we have Michigan State at 85 nationally, okay. And then what we have is uh, essentially a range of uh, ratio data. So we have the in-state tuition in dollars, the out-of-state tuition in dollars, and the uh, undergraduate enrollment. Okay, so this is all fairly clear um, ratio data that hopefully you will understand it has a, a non-arbitrary zero point, and uh, we engage with this type of data on a regular basis, which just leaves the year founded which is kind of the outlier here, which obviously is going to be a type of interval data um, because uh, this is, you know, 1817 that we basically have uh, for uh, the University of Michigan being founded, uh, which essentially is a relatively arbitrary date relative to, you know, uh, how old the Earth actually is. Okay. Great, so hopefully that's kind of sunk in. Uh, you will get tested on that when we when we do the informal tests and then we do the actual formal testing. So you need to be aware of those data types. Now I just kind of need to wrap up with some other key uh, scientific terms that we use because it's, it's important as to how you then kind of understand uh, scientific measurements and using instruments to actually measure, okay? So we have this kind of concept of precision that we're, we're interested in understanding, okay? So um, precision essentially is uh, the level of exactness associated with a measurement. And it's restricted by the quality of the instrument that we may have um, that we actually are going to use. So let's say we're measuring uh, the pH level in a river or we're interested in measuring the type of radiation that we getting this background radiation okay this is all going to be indicative of the instrument that we're going to have okay but I'm just going to use this kind of classic example which is used in the book uh, which is people throwing darts at a board essentially so you can see here this is a bullseye none of these darts have actually hit the bullseye um, they're all clustered in the kind of uh, lower right hand uh, quadrant lower right hand part of the board uh, but they are actually very precise okay so they're not accurate they're not on the bullseye but they're all within uh, a very um, uh, small distance of each other okay so it's producing uh, an exact measurement even if that measurement isn't necessarily true to its original value and that kind of corresponds with uh, so that contrasts with accuracy which is kind of this different concept okay so it's the correspondence between the value which you obtain from the instrument and the true value, okay? So the true value here is, is essentially, um, uh, let's say that uh, we're trying to throw the dart at the board. Um, when this point gets the bullseye, uh, you know, that, that point that it's hit at is, is basically the true value that you wanted to hit, okay? Um, and uh, you, you can say here that uh, it's, it's reasonably accurate. Um, so um, these darts that are being thrown at the board uh, uh, are not all hitting um, uh, the bullseye, unfortunately, but they're all within the realm of possibility of hitting that area, um, even if they're not precise. Okay, so there's a little bit of uncertainty in how they're, they're, they're repeatedly measured in kind of each direction. Okay. So what this basically means is that we can have um, uh, instruments that basically are not accurate, so they're, they're not uh, getting towards the bullseye that we want, and they're simultaneously not precise, okay, so there's quite a large amount of variability between each one of the repeated experiments that we have. We could have an example like we had before where we had quite an accurate uh, set of results, but they're not necessarily precise. So there's a little bit of variation between each one of the measurements, but they're generally getting close to the true value. Or we could have something that's not accurate, so we're not close to the true value, um, but we are precise in the way that we repeatedly measure um, close to the value which we, we, we keep repeatedly getting. 
ideally what we want, okay, so this is the holy grail, <laughs> is essentially we want to have a set of measurement techniques which are accurate and simultaneously precise, okay? This is very hard. Uh, often we need to be aware that a lot of our measurement techniques may not be accurate and they may not be precise, and therefore we need to kind of portray the scientific findings and the results that we obtain being cognizant of these particular issues that we have, okay? So this is an example just to give you some uh, some kind of uh, written out information of precision and accuracy. Okay, so imagine we had a true distance and that true distance was 41.71 inches. And then basically we took a, a sequence of measurements for this first example and we were getting 44.212, 44.189. 44 so obviously we're not that accurate. We're quite far from the true uh, value, but we are getting quite a, a reasonable degree of precision in our repeated experiments. Okay, so this is quite high precision. It's repeatedly producing a similar measurement, um, but we're actually quite low accuracy. We're quite far away from the true value. Okay, um, down here what we have is 41.71, 41.73, 41.72. So this is this is a highly accurate set of data, okay? And it's also highly precise. We're repeatedly producing um, the, the same uh, measurements uh, that, that we want to produce, okay? So this is kind of the holy grail. And then um, that kind of contrasts with an example where maybe we had uh, 41.7, uh, 40, 43.4, where essentially we've got reasonably high accuracy. We're in the right kind of ballpark, close to the true value, but the problem is that we've got low precision, so we've got variability each time that we measure, okay? So you just need to be aware of these concepts, how we kind of delineate the difference between the two of them, and that will be made kind of clearer when we get through um, some of the, 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 the informal tests, for example, and you can kind of recap on what we've done here before we get to that. And then finally, you'll be tested on this at the end of the module and in the midterms. <laughs> Okay, so here's just kind of a real world example. So this is a paper which I produced for the World Bank where I was assessing uh, 5G deployment across uh, eight low and middle income countries. Okay, so I carried out these detailed 5G assessments for Malawi, uh, Uganda, Senegal, Kenya, Pakistan, Albania, Peru and Mexico. And uh, essentially what you're looking at here are the kind of um, fiber optic routes that exist in black and then basically I've had to plan a range of additional fiber optic deployments in order to connect regions that aren't necessarily currently connected, okay? The reason why I'm telling you this is that I had to report um, the percentage coverage that could be achieved viably through commercial means for 5G deployments, okay? And I recognize that all of uh, the data that I'm getting, it's kind of riddled with assumptions, the data is not always great, and that there's a lot of kind of uncertainty uh, in my model, and that means that it's quite hard to be, uh, um, it's quite hard to be accurate, uh, and also quite hard to be precise. Um, and, and as I can't be accurate, I need to kind of dial down the level of precision that I report, okay? So for each one of these strategies, scenarios and strategies here for Universal Broadband in Peru, for example, what I'm doing is I'm reporting the population decile, okay? So basically, um, rather than reporting the percentage of the population I think I can cover viably, I'm recognizing that I can't be very precise, and therefore, rather than having um, 99 degrees of freedom using percentages, which would be highly precise, I'm just reporting uh, deciles, which means there's only nine degrees of freedom, okay? So we'll, we'll, we'll cover what degrees of freedom mean later, but essentially with deciles, obviously you only have 10 of them, okay? But whereas with percentage points, you have 100 of them. So you, it's just about kind of recognizing the shortcomings in the input data and the results that are eventually produced, okay? So you just kind of have to make a sensible judgment call on this when you're doing um, uh, work in, for example, your dissertation or when you go out into industry. It's not necessarily reflection on you. Um, it's actually almost more admirable and respectful if you recognize the uncertainty in the data and you don't try to put forth a kind of false sense of precision which simply isn't there, okay? That's almost the worst possible uh, thing you can do because then it's almost like you're saying that there's a certainty that this outcome is going to happen uh, with this value and that's probably just highly unlikely, okay? So I'll give you an example and uh, this is kind of off my LinkedIn profile and I've kind of removed quite a few of uh, the kind of 
uh, personal identifiable information uh, pieces on this. But, but the key point is that these people had basically assessed what the cost was going to be uh, for deploying uh, 5G private networks in large enterprises, okay? And um, someone had estimated that the benefits would be by 2027, uh, you know, 7,082.1 million, okay? So uh, that's uh, over 7 billion, but they've reported it to an incredibly high level of precision. Um, and someone that I know had just basically said that anyone trying to do forecasts with five digit accuracy on the seven year horizon is mathematically clueless. And that really doesn't inspire confidence. So I really want you guys to kind of be critically aware of how you kind of represent the uncertainty and the estimates that you make. And then when you do that, you need to kind of report uh, the results in a, in a kind of uh, in a, in, in a reasonable way for what you're trying to report. Okay, so trying to present a really high precision when you just don't have it, you know, seven years out, it's just not going to be the case. Okay. So let's just finish the lecture off now. Validity. Um, so how well the variable being analysed actually measures the question at hand. And this is kind of hard because if you have these uh, latent variables like quality of life, so I say latent because there is no one single variable which indicates quality of life, okay? You have to recognise that quality of life is made up of lots of different types of variables. So it could be your environmental um, uh, quality that you live in, it could be the work-life balance that you have, it could relate partly to your income, it could relate to your household circumstances. So all of these different things affect your quality of life, okay? So um, you're going to have to try and define what that is, first of all, and then you're going to have to try to measure what quality of life may be uh, for a particular neighbourhood, okay? So whether that's the number of restaurants, the presence of museums, the walkability score, they're all going to be traded off, okay? So it's quite hard to actually uh, measure what this may mean in a valid way. So the process of actually trying to then valid, uh, to validate a model output is, is, is something that needs to be done by all of us, um, but it's also a hard thing to, to actually achieve. So we tried to do that uh, in this particular uh, Wi-Fi assessment paper, which I mentioned before, which you've got the archive reference for for, the, for here. Essentially, what we did was we, uh, to try and validate, we basically plotted the real data that we had against the predicted data. So we were able to look at how uh, kind of um, uh, accurate our uh, actual predictions were. And we got a reasonable degree of um, coherence between basically our estimates and the estimates that were achieved uh, through collecting actual empirical data. Okay, so that gives you some sort of confidence uh, that you're, you know, you're measuring uh, the underlying characteristics which influence that outcome variable. And you, you can kind of validate it in this way. Reliability, this is basically the consistency and the stability of the data measurements. So how reliable are um, the, the repeated measurements that you actually take? Okay, so uh, you can use test and retest procedures if you're using a survey or a questionnaire. You can use a longitudinal study uh, where you... Um, you know, you consider whether the kind of uh, longitudinal uh, data collection approach that you've taken is actually consistent over time. Uh, there might be serious issues. You know, it might be that you have certain demographics which basically you kind of lose through the longitudinal study, which means that then what you end up with when you look at the kind of longitudinal picture is maybe a biased sample that you have, and therefore you need to consider how reliable those results are going to be. OK, great. I recognise that that was a lot of information, uh, but thanks for tuning in. And uh, this is me kind of rounding off now what is the second lecture for GGS 200, GGS 300, sorry. And that was uh, today we were focusing on the introduction to kind of geographic data. So uh, you've got the chapter in the book to read. Uh, you've got my details if you need to reach out to me and uh, don't hesitate to, to, to contact me. Uh, I'll see you now uh, in the actual laboratory session. OK, so in the lab, we're going to do our first kind of proper R session. And uh, I'll be introducing you, uh, if you're not familiar, to how you actually, uh, you know, use uh, the scripting functionality, uh, how you save things in, in the memory, in the environment, how you print things to console and then eventually have, we're going to do a bit of data visualization okay great so thank you very much for tuning in it's been great that you were able to attend and please let, do let me know if you have any further questions okay thank you very much goodbye